Lenny Patrick, Chicago Mob Gambler. Outfit Captain. A.K.A. Morris Cohen. Born October 6, 1913. Died March 1, 2006. Chicago Mob Bookie and Extortionist and Informant. In 1980, Gus Alex, at age 75, was busted by the FBI on the grounds that he had approved extortion schemes. He was indicted along with Lenny Patrick, then 78, and enforcers Nick Gio and Mario Reno. The roof came down on them after Rhino threatened a construction company owner named Alex Tapper telling Trapper, pay up or your entire family will wind up in Mount Carmel Cemetery. Tapper refused to bend. Gus Alex ordered Nick Gio and Jimmy Lavalley to beat Tapper up, which they did but went overboard and put him in the hospital. Lavalley turned state's witness and Gus Alex and Lenny Patrick were picked up and held in the new correctional institution in Chicago. However, Alex was released to house arrest confinement to his luxurious Lakeshore Drive home because, he claimed, the food at the jail made his stomach ulcer bleed by this time. Lenny Patrick was already working the FBI, having carried a body mic and recorded conversations between him and Gus Alex. Then, in 1992, Patrick flipped back to the criminal side even though he had taken $7,200 in cash payment from the FBI over a two-month period. They, he went back to the FBI and said that he would stool pigeon for them again in exchange for leniency. The case went to court. The judge was U.S. District Court Judge James H. Elysia, who was gangster Roger Tui's nephew Elysia, eventually sentenced Alex to 15 years and 8 months plus 823000 in fines and 1400 a month rent, as he called it, for the cost of keeping him in jail. Under federal sentencing guidelines, Patrick had no chance for parole. At the age 77, he would most certainly die in jail. Patrick testified for three and a half colorful days in a packed courtroom in the Dirksen Federal Building. Unlike the refined Alex who had gone out of his way to improve himself, Patrick purposely remained coarse in his ways and foul in his language. While Alex moved to Lake Shore Drive and kept condominiums in Florida and Germany, Patrick, a product of West Side Jewish neighborhoods, stayed in a modest brick house on the north side. Unlike Alex, Patrick was proud of his lifestyle at one point explaining that he killed a man because in that world it was him or me and I wasn't going nowhere. Patrick, the son of Jewish immigrants from England, said he quit school at 15 or 16, ran a dice game with cab drivers on west side sidewalks and engaged in the occasional holdup. Patrick's eldest brother, Charles, a.k.a. Charlie Green, a member of the 42 gang, was shot dead by a police detective named Sergeant Thomas Cooper when, according to Cooper's report, Patrick and two others attempted to rob a tea room at 3253 South Michigan. Edward Smith, who was with Patrick, was also shot and killed, and a third gang member, Jack Gold, was injured. Gold, who was seriously wounded, denied they intended to rob anyone. That was no holdup, he said from his cot at the Bridewell Hospital, and the killing of Charles Patrick and Edward Benish, a.k.a. Eddie Smith, was plain murder. It all happened as the result of a quarrel over a woman with a policeman. Patrick's father, Morris, and Jack Gold told the coroner's investigation that the so-called tea room was actually a brothel run by Blanche Whistlon. They said Charles Patrick and the others had gone there to force Wilson to pay for their medical bills after they had contacted gonorrhea at the brothel. None of them were armed, and they said that a gun found on the scene was placed there by Detective Cooper, who was a bouncer at the house. Cooper said he heard a disturbance from the street, entered the house, and say Patrick choking Mrs. Wilson. When he drew his service revolver, Patrick drew on him. At the time he was killed, Charles Patrick was wanted in the 1927 robbery of a coal company in which three employees were shot and an innocent bystander, Freed Madsen, was killed. In 1933, was sentenced to seven years in prison for bank robbery. He learned in the joint that bank robbery is not the thing to do, said Jerry Gladden, chief investigator for the Chicago Crime Commission, gambling is where you make money. He admitted that he was the triggerman in two killings and ordered the killings of four bookmakers, insisting, I don't get a kick out of killing people. I'd done it to protect myself. And added that he wasn't the only gangster in the 1940s and 1950s to kill rivals to gain and keep control of gambling in the Chicago area. Everyone else did the same thing, he told Adam. Your client did the same thing. You're trying to bury me. There's no saints in this room. To which Judge Elysia repeatedly interrupted Patrick's rambling and admonishing him to answer Adam's question. I'm sorry, Judge, I really am, Patrick said. But when questioned about the 1947 slaying of bookmaker Harry Crotish, with the prosecution using Crotish's nickname, The Horse, a moniker Patrick said he did not know. I did murder him, but he didn't have a horse, Patrick said. 
If he did, I would have jumped on it and run with it. When asked why he killed Crotish, she said that it was because there was a rumor that Crotish, then 29, another West Side bookmaker, wanted to take over. So I shot him. Crotish died from four gunshot wounds to the head. He recalled that he ordered three other bookmaking rivals killed, Edward Murphy in 1950, David Zatz in 1952, and Milton Glickman in 1953. When asked if he had killed anyone other than the six he mentioned, Patrick replied, No, I've run out of cemeteries. He told the court that he killed his first man, Herman Glick, on Chicago's west side because Glick, then only 21 years old, had knocked him down in a fistfight at a dice game. He hit me and I went down, Patrick said. I killed him a week later. I shot him in the head. He boasted that he beat the rap because 1932, the law didn't accept as evidence a dying man's statement naming the killer. The testimony laughter from an otherwise orderly courtroom watched over by a dozen security officers. Veteran defense lawyer Julius Lucius Eccles dropped in to watch the trial and said he was amazed at Patrick's repeated admissions of killing, observing that even very old murder cases can be prosecuted. There is no statute of limitations for murder. In the late 1930s, he joined a gang, robbing two banks, but he was arrested in an Indiana holdup and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Out of prison in 1940, Patrick took a job running the biggest dice game in Chicago for gamblers who put up the stakes. It was at that point, he said that he met Sam Giancana, Paul Ricca, and Felix Alderigio. I used to get $3 a day in tips, Patrick said. I stole about $30 a night. In 1945, Patrick and his brother were fired by William Gallitz, a powerful West Side gambling boss. Patrick said he decided to kill Gallitz, his partner, David Yaras, shotgun Gallitz to death and took his territory on the predominantly Jewish West Side for the mob and worked mostly in the bookmaking business, taking bets on baseball, football and horse racing and running poker and blackjack games and even bingo. Patrick controlled the mob's bookmaking operation on the West Side from 1946 until the early 1950s, paying off hundreds of thousands to aldermen and three police captains to stay out of trouble. When the Jewish population migrated to the North Side and gambling fell off, Patrick was approved to move to Rogers Park, a Jewish neighborhood. He boasted that he paid off the cops well into the 1960s and in one year he made as much as $850,000 from the sports gambling business because of heavy betting on the World Series won by the New York Mets or when the New York Jets upset the Baltimore Colts in the Super Bowl. He bragged about his ruthlessness and said he even leaned on his own relatives, threatening his brother Mike's son-in-law to coerce Mike to pay off a $250,000 debt. And in the late 1980s, he extorted $187,000 from his common-law wife's nephew. It was my own money, he said. He was convicted in 1977 of criminal contempt of court for refusing to testify at a federal trial and assumed charge of his street crew in the 1980s. He said that he went into the juice loan business in the mid-1980s after Sam Carlisi, whom he identified as the Chicago mob boss at the time, lent him $200,000. He said that a short time later, Jimmy Marcello, a top Carlisi aide, asked him to cause some problems at the Lake Theater in downtown Oak Park to force the owners to join the projectionist union. On his orders, Patrick said, several members of his street crew tried to firebomb the theater several times, but all of the efforts failed. Patrick also said Carlisi and John DeFranzo muscled him out of street taxes he had collected for 15 years from one gambler, personally giving him the word at the funeral of Carlisi's brother. But he denied the prosecution's contention that it was Carlisi and DeFranzo who gave him his orders, not Alex. When Carlisi and DeFranzo muscled him out of the street tax, Patrick said he even went to Alex to complain, but Alex didn't do anything about it. Still scrappy, bitter and irritable and coming across like the back alley fighter he was, Patrick's presence screamed of a bygone era of organized crime. He gave his testimony sitting less than 30 feet away from Gus Alex. Alex's lawyer attacked Patrick of, in his words, pulling off the master con game of his life and called the gangster evil incarnate, this diabolical piece of slime and one of the most cunning, conniving, evil, twisted people that you'll ever see. There's no limit to this man, the lawyer said of Patrick, there's no limit to what he will do or say. I don't like to be here today to testify, but I either testify or die, Patrick responded, if I get caught lying one time, that's it, I get 20 or 30 years. I don't want to die here, that's all. It's a true story, that's all. I don't have the guts to die here. You're talking in a low, conspiratorial tone, one of his lawyers complained, I got a bad throat, Patrick replied. If I had a scotch I'd be better off. 
causing the courtroom to chuckle and causing the judge to again warn Patrick to stop the running commentary. This is a courtroom, not a nightclub, but Patrick continued to send wise crack and sly remarks which sent his attorneys into minor convulsions. At one point, in an effort to show his better side, he told the court how he fed spaghetti and meatballs to possums in a favorite forest preserve. He waxed on about how he and Alex were remarkable creatures because they had managed to survive so long in the hostels of the underworld and were still in business and not living in Florida sucking on cigars and grapefruit. I don't like to testify, said Patrick, his head bowed, but I don't want to die in prison. He defended his actions by explaining that he pleaded guilty to extortion charges after the FBI gathered enough evidence to send him away for a long time. When Alex's lawyers lit into Patrick's person, Patrick snapped back in complete sarcasm, yes. I am the dirtiest thing living on earth. I don't have feelings for anybody. Everybody's so afraid of me they shiver when they see me. They put on an extra coat. He described how a lifelong friend scammed him by getting him to put up $165,000 to finance a non-existent bookmaking operation. The friend disappeared, and Patrick had another man he suspected of being involved in the scam severely beaten. I went for it, and I'm supposed to be the con man, Patrick said to nervous laughter in the courtroom but I don't want any tag day for me. Patrick also admitted extorting money from some well-known businesses and people, including the Big Bear grocery store chain, the Black Angus restaurant, and insurance executive Alan Dorfman, who was killed in 1983. Patrick said Yaris extorted $30,000 from Dorfman while he was nearby. He and Yaris split $75,000 and gave the rest to syndicate bosses, he said. He said that his crew consisted of Gio, Raynon, and Raymond Spencer, the crew's street boss, until his death in 1984. Spencer was a suspect in the Alan Dorfman murder. Lenny Yaris, who was gunned down in 1985 by two men in ski masks, was the gang's go-between for mob bookies. Gary Edwards, who assisted in the crew's extortion, juice loan, and gambling operations, later turned state's evidence against the others. Pete Bonomo, who allegedly picked up extortion payments on behalf of Raynome, was a member. So was Joe Vento, described as an outfit member assigned to oversee the crew's juice loan business, and Phil Tolomeo, who assisted in the crew's juice loan business. The crew's primary source of income was the 260% interest it got from lending money to Desperate Gambler. Patrick admitted he came up with the idea to extort Ray Hara, owner of King Nissan, whom he had known for more than 40 years. Patrick conned Hara into paying him $150,000, half of what his own mob enforcers had demanded. Hara did not know that Patrick sent the collectors, I did give him a break, Patrick said. I cut in half. I'm proud of myself. I thought he had too much. That's why I asked for it. When he was done testifying, his underlying Nikki Geo stepped forward in court and offered to help Patrick walk and go to the bathroom at the Metropolitan Correctional Center if the two could be placed on the same floor. He told the judge that he, Patrick, almost died in the hole. They didn't get him any medical attention. But the judge cut him off and told Gio to let his attorney talk for him. Patrick was the only one of the prosecution's approximately 20 witnesses to implicate Alex as the boss of the North Side Street crew. At one point during the trial, the prosecutor claimed that Gus Alex tried to buy Patrick's silence for $50,000, relaying the message through Patrick's lawyer. According to Patrick, the lawyer told him that Alex would give Patrick's longtime girlfriend $50,000 if Patrick keeps his mouth shut and doesn't testify against him, meaning Alex. The lawyer would also keep another $50,000 for himself and added that if you don't, you're going to be shot dead. Patrick did admit that the story was dubious and that he was angry at the lawyer because he milked me dry by charging $74,000 in legal fees before Patrick began cooperating with the government. To prove that Alex was the true boss of the crew and not Lenny Patrick, Patrick's lawyers wanted to call Gus Zappas, secretary-treasurer of the Laundry Workers Union, in an attempt to explain alleged payoffs to Gus Alex, but the judge quashed the subpoena when Zappas' lawyer said his client would plead the Fifth Amendment and refuse to testify. Patrick testified for the government that Zappas annually gave him and Alex $14,000, proving, the government said, that Gus Alex shared in Patrick's crew's take. While the trial dragged on, without Alex to keep a lid on things, his street crew was out of control. Lenny Patrick's daughter parked in the driveway of her home in a quiet residential area of Rogers Park and walked into her home. Several minutes later the car exploded. No one was hurt in the blast, but the bomb left a driveway crater five inches deep and two feet across. It was probably activated by remote control, perhaps by someone positioned nearby on North California Avenue in view of the house. 
The explosion blew out windows and demolished a 1987 BMW, which was owned by Sharon Patrick's fiancé Robert Goodman, a building contractor. The force of the blast vented through the BMW's sunroof so there was no fire. If the motive for the bombing was to get him to shut up, I don't think it will work, one cop said Lenny and Sharon Patrick don't get along. They haven't spoken to one another in years. So I doubt the bombing is going to seriously upset him. Apparently, the father-daughter dispute stemmed from Lenny Patrick's divorce of Lorraine, Sharon's mother, in the 1960s. Sharon Patrick, angry with her father for cutting off financial support to his former wife and family, publicly berated him in front of mob friends in a restaurant. In the end, the facts and evidence were too overwhelming. Alex was found guilty, but largely based on Patrick's testimony. Patrick died in 2006 at age 93.